Hello class, this is Professor Khan. Uh, today I wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about plot and the story arc. Uh, and this uh, fairly brief uh, slideshow and presentation is really designed to help you uh, write uh, paper one. Uh, and you'll be, of course, you know, writing a little bit of plot summary for some other papers as well, and also for your departmental exam. Um, remember uh, to you know make sure to go in and read those paper one directions very carefully. Uh, watch the presentation that I uh, have uh, posted about paper one, and uh, read uh, very carefully the sample essay as well as the rubric. Uh, one you know very important thing that you need to do for paper one is to uh, sprinkle in to your plot summary uh, certain terms. And that's one of the things I'm going to be, you know, sort of grading the paper on. Uh, you know, I think all of us have at some point or another um, given plot summary. You know, we, we watch a movie that we love, we're excited about, and maybe friends of ours want to see it too. And we start telling them a little bit about the plot. We sort of summarize the plot. Um, hopefully we don't give what we call spoilers, right? <laughs> but uh, we're all, you know, I think naturally adept at giving plot summary. But when it comes to, you know, sort of formal um, literary analysis and academic writing, uh, certainly for this class, we want to be careful about using certain terms and, and understanding these terms and concepts uh, a little bit more deeply. So we'll start by uh, talking about what we just call the story arc. And what you see here is sort of a graphic representation of a classic story arc. Um, all stories have arcs to them, uh, but there are, you know, as many types of story arcs, I suppose, as there are stories under the sun. And, um, you know, writers, I think, are aware of the story arc. They understand um, the structure of, of stories. Uh, but uh, writers, you know, one of the things they do is they sort of bend these uh, these rules of thumb uh, to their own will, and they, they create story arcs that suit the story that they're, they're trying to write. Um, it's also important to note that, you know, what you see here is really uh, an example of a story arc for for something like a short story, you know, like a literary short story that we're reading in this class, uh, or, or you know, uh, perhaps a, a narrative essay. Chances are, in your Comp One classes, you may have written like a personal narrative where you wrote a story about yourself. It wasn't a fictional story; it was a nonfiction story, but it still followed uh, a kind of arc, right? Um, Longer stories and uh, novels, for instance, or perhaps movies, or these days, of course, we, you know, are enjoying this new golden era of television where we have uh, seasonal arcs or perhaps multi-seasonal arcs. Um, you know, these get much more complicated. You can have multiple arcs following multiple characters. Um, so really what we're talking about here is a very simple, basic story arc uh, that we can apply to relatively short stories, in this case, uh, literary short fiction. So traditionally, uh, these types of stories begin with what we call exposition. Exposition is when the narrator of the story explains things to us, the readers, tells us things. Um, when exposition begins uh, a story, oftentimes this is what we call backstory. Backstory is just a specific kind of exposition that explains sort of necessary need to know background information. Uh, stuff that happened, you know, before the action of the story really kicks off. Um, in Raymond Carver's excellent short story, Cathedral, um, he follows a fairly traditional story arc. Um, and in fact, he really piles on 
the exposition and the backstory on the front end of, of his story. I would say uh, that the first five paragraphs of his story, and those are long paragraphs, so that's about two and a half pages worth of writing. That stuff is backstory. All of those paragraphs are really giving us the background about um, the narrator's wife and the narr narrator's wife's relationship with Robert, uh, who of course is a, a secondary character who comes into the story a little bit later. Uh, and we learn you know, all kinds of things, especially about the wife in those first five paragraphs. It's interesting that we don't learn much about the narrator. The narrator doesn't talk about himself very much until later in the story when he's engaging in dialogue with Robert. And I think that's an interesting, an interesting aspect to the story. You know, this this narrator, Bub, we'll call him. That's we don't know his name. That's what Robert calls him. Uh, but Bub is very. Um, reluctant to share information about himself in the story and it's only until later when he and Robert are sitting in the living room talking that he really becomes more open and I, I anyway I think I find that very interesting um, now after those first five paragraphs uh, we get a little bit of action and I'll talk about that in a minute and then we come back to more exposition you might remember there are several paragraphs in there about um, Robert and his wife. Uh, Robert, of course, is traveling in order to attend the, um, uh, to visit the family of his wife who has passed away. And so we get uh, even further backstory exposition uh, from the narrator about uh, Robert and, and his wife. Um, broken up, though, after those first five paragraphs, we get a little bit of, of action but then again, we return to some backstory. Think of exposition, whether it's backstory or, or another kind of exposition, just as when the narrator is you know, really teaching us about something, informing us about something that we need to know. I mean, exposition could come very simply in, in, in uh, the form of the narrator, you know, describing what something looks like or describing what a person acts like or looks like. Even that could be simple exposition. So exposition doesn't have to just occur at the beginning of a story. Sometimes it doesn't occur at the beginning of a story. You know, again, this is a traditional story arc that we're showing here, and writers can play around with this as, as much or as little as they wish. Um, exposition can occur really anywhere in a story. You know, it's very, very common to see in the middle of a story, you know, the narrator sort of put the brakes on the action, give us some more backstory that is now, you know, relevant. Um, and I think we, we see that in certainly some of the stories that we're dealing with in paper one. So exposition can occur really anywhere in the story, but traditionally a lot of stories kick off with exposition and usually that exposition takes the form of what we call backstory. Taking a look at what's happened prior to the beginning of the story's action, um, giving us some need to know background. Well, you know, relatively quickly, because these are short stories, um, we need things to begin happening. We can't just have a narrator provide exposition and that's the whole story. We need action to occur. When things begin to occur, that's when we typically see conflict introduced. Now, that doesn't mean that exposition and backstory and things like this can't introduce conflict or uh, predict conflict or foreshadow conflict. It certainly can, and I think that's definitely true here in the story Cathedral. Um, but ultimately, we need action to occur. Action is that vehicle that carries with it the tension and the suspense. And we call this part of the story the rising action, the rising action because that tension, that suspense is growing, it's rising. Now, you know, consider Cathedral. We're, there's tension and suspense in that story. You know, we, we, we feel the tension between the narrator and his wife. 
uh, we we know we're, we're given access to what the narrator thinks about Robert, and so we as readers sort of wonder, well, what's going to happen with these two? Like there's a there's a tension between the two. It's, of course, it's more on the narrator's side than Robert's side. Like we're, the narrator is the one who has all of these prejudiced ideas about blind people. Um, you know, he's the one facing a situation where his wife old friend is coming to visit and they have a prior relationship that doesn't include him so of course there's going to be some tension there right Robert seems to be very cool about everything but of course we're not given any access into what Robert is really thinking we just see him talk and act it's the narrator who we're really learning about and feeling that tension come off of um, but anyway that first action that occurs in a story is what kicks off what we call the rising action, right? Things that occur, things happen. We call these things plot points. Really, that's what a plot summary is. It's just a collection of plot points, just back to back to back, right? These are the, the things that happen in a story. In particular, these plot points, like I say, help to promote and help to communicate to us conflict, tension, suspense, these kinds of things. Uh, plot points occur after opening exposition, if there is any. Of course, a story can begin first sentence with rising action. It doesn't have to begin with exposition. Um, and it's important to stress that any action that begins the plot of the story is the beginning of what we call rising action. If I ask you to identify, well, where's, where's the beginning of the rising action in Cathedral? We would point to um, the sixth paragraph where the wife is in the kitchen preparing dinner and she and Robert are having this brief conversation. OK, there's a little bit of tension there. Again, the wife and the, and the narrator don't seem to have the best of relationships, but it's not like we need, you know, like a car chase or a gunfight or something really intense in order to call that the beginning of rising action. Rising action begins with the very first moment of action in the story, no matter where that occurs. Uh, we, um, we who write and study and, and teach um, short fiction um, and narrative in general talk about a concept called forward momentum. You know, I like to use the analogy that a, a good short story is like a, a car. It needs the fuel of tension and suspense to drive the narrative forward, to make the reader move through the story and read paragraph to paragraph to paragraph because the reader is hooked and the reader, you know, wants to know what is going to ultimately happen in the story. Now, in paper two, we're going to be talking uh, much more specifically about character and types of characters and conflicts and types of conflicts. Um, you know, for now, all I'll say is the story arc really is sort of a map, uh, at least in, in a short story, is kind of a map of the journey of the main character. We call that main character the protagonist. And that main character or protagonist has got to be involved in some sort of conflict that is helping to create tension and suspense. And that, in turn, hopefully hopefully hooks the reader, gets them interested in the story and the, and the plight of the character, so to speak. And we keep reading, we keep being uh, propelled forward in a forward momentum through the story because we wanna see what happens in the story. And all of this rising action is ultimately leading up to what we call the climax of the story. The climax is um, both the sort of height of dramatic tension uh, but it's also when the tension or the suspense sort of breaks. It's, it's when we see 
what happens, right? We, we see um, what we've been waiting for as, as readers. Uh, we see some sort of conflict that is solved or is overcome in some way, or perhaps not. Perhaps we see in the climax that the, the character uh, hasn't been able to deal with or resolve the conflict. We certainly have what we call unresolved endings in short stories. Um, I would say here in Cathedral that, well, you know, it's an interesting discussion. I would say that there's ultimately resolution in this story. We'll talk about resolution a little bit more in a moment. Um, the climax of the story, once again, is sort of that height of the story. It's the moment that we, the readers, have been really waiting for. We really don't know what's going to happen until we reach that climactic moment. The climax is usually, in a short story, not drawn out very long, right? It's a short story. There's only a minimal amount of space to work with. Uh, in some stories, some longer stories, it can be drawn out, you know, over multiple paragraphs. That is possible. And in even longer stories, like you might find in novels, uh, not only might you have pages worth of sort of climactic action, um, but you might have multiple climactic moments uh, that, that uh, multiple characters are experiencing in their own individual story arcs. So things can get a lot more complicated in novels and you know maybe TV series and perhaps longer movies and things like that. Um, I would say for uh, Carver's story, Cathedral, the climactic moment is literally the last line of the story. It is the last line when um, Bub says what he says, you know, when he when he and Robert are sitting there at the table drawing this cathedral together, uh, Bub has this really simple but also exquisitely transcendent moment where he really steps outside of himself and his own prejudices and his own um, you know, sort of biased beliefs, and he experiences something truly remarkable, this really remarkable connection with another human being. Um, and when he, he recognizes that in the last line, you know, now the readers can kind of see, ah, oh, this is what all of these last few pages have been leading up to. It's been, it hasn't been leading up to a fight with Robert. It hasn't been leading up to a denial of Robert or a denial of um, the possibility of opening up uh, an experience. Uh, it's, it's been leading up to a moment where the, the, the main character really embraces that experience. And that happens and it's conf it happens for, you know, it sort of builds up for the, those last few paragraphs, but it's ultimately confirmed in that last line. And I would call that the climax of the story. So that's interesting, right? I mean, according to the story arc, we have other things going on, right? But in order to really kind of identify the climax, you want to ask yourself, am I still wondering what's going to happen to the main character? Um, based upon what the story has set up. Sure, I'm theoretically sort of abstractly interested in Bub and, you know, what's going to happen after this moment. I mean, is, is Bub going to start behaving like a better husband? Is he going to start behaving like a more conscientious person? Is he going to strike up a, a long-lasting friendship with Robert? You know, I sort of abstractly wonder those things. But that stuff isn't what the story is about. The story is setting itself up as this, you know, evening uh, at dinner and in the living room, and that's it. That's really all that the story is setting out to, to, uh, to portray and to show us. So, yeah, I'm abstractly interested in Bub and Robert, um, and the wife and their lives after this moment. But that's, again, not what the story's dealing with. Um, I, I feel like when I read Cathedral and I read that last line, I've come to a moment where I see now what everything in the story has been leading up to. So that's a good sort of litmus test to determine where the climax of the story is. Um, if you're 
still wondering what's going to happen within the confines of the story to the main character, you know, maybe we haven't reached the climax yet. In a short story, that climax is definitely going to occur at, at the end of the story somewhere. It may not be the last line, but it could be. Uh, certainly, Cathedral is, is that type of story, and there will be others that we read where we have a similar sort of climactic last line. Um, but it definitely occurs toward the end of the story. You, you can't look in the middle of a story, and certainly not the beginning of a story, in order to find the climax of the story. Again, think about the fact that these are short stories. You, you, you can't really have a short story with the climax on you know, the fifth page and then have seven more pages of story. That, does, that, that, doesn't, that won't really work in terms of what a short story is trying to do. A climax is going to occur toward the end of a story. In some stories, after the climactic moment, after that climax, uh, we do have sometimes falling action. Falling action is simply any action, any plot points that occur after the climax of the story. We don't see that in Cathedral, but we will see that in other stories. Then we have some sort of resolution. Now, the French have a word called denouement which um, it's kind of a nice word because it really kind of combines the climax, falling action, and resolution kind of all at one. And I think for short stories, that's a very useful term because those three things can occur kind of all together or very close together there at the end of a story. Uh, when we talk about resolution, though, we're really talking about the resolution of the, of the conflict. You know, ha has the main character's conflict with another character been resolved? Or do we learn that it, that conflict is now unresolved? Um, has the main character's internal conflicts with whatever sort of competing um, character traits, has that been resolved? Has the character finally come to, to peace? Um, or not, right? So we learn these things at the end of a story, uh, certainly beginning with the climax, but we might uh, come to a better understanding of some of those things in any of the writing that occurs after that climactic moment. It's very common for short stories to have quick resolutions. Sometimes, like we say, the climax is at the very end of the story. So when you're looking for the climax of a story, just keep that in mind. Um, like we say in paper one, you want to be using plot terms. Um, it's really sort of up to you on how you how many you use. I don't expect you to use them in every sentence. In fact, I don't want that. But definitely choose, you know, a handful of plot terms from the slideshow uh, and use them in your paper number one. Uh, identifying the climax of the story is something that you really must do for paper one. So good storytellers understand the traditional story arc, but they are not necessarily confined by it. And I'll speak more about that in just a moment. Uh, just a couple more, a few more plot uh, terms that you might find useful. Um, there's a plot device called in media res, which is a Latin expression that basically means into the middle of things. Um, and I'm sure that you've watched a movie or a TV show uh, that has used this device. Uh, in a, uh, a story that uses in media res, we begin the story with action, and usually it's, you know, kind of some intense action that immediately grabs the reader, the reader's attention, or the viewer's attention, the audience's attention. Um, and we we get wrapped up in that action. We don't we don't we, we may not know anything about the characters or really what's going on with the action, um, but we're sort of hooked. And then the narrator or the storyteller will you know put the story put put that action on pause, and then we'll jump back in time and start getting some background and story that leads up to that action. So again, we see this a lot in 
you know, movies, we see it a lot in TV. Sometimes we see it in short stories and novels. Um, and sometimes, you know, we do see it in, in literary short fiction. It's not that common, but we do sometimes see it. Flashback, of course, is when the forward moving plot, which usually is given in chronological order. Again, that may be something that uh, specific writers might break. Uh, but when we are moving forward in time chronologically and we stop and we jump back or flash back to a previous moment in time, we call that a flashback. Now, that flashback could be simply delivering some backstory to us, but it also might open up into action and dialogue itself. And certainly one of our two short stories for paper one definitely makes use of flashback. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, both stories do, but one of them definitely uses it to a, to a large degree. Um, so flashback, just be on the lookout for the, the possibility of flashback. And of course we have flash forward, which is kind of the opposite. This is when we jump ahead in time. And I mentioned earlier the term foreshadowing. This is when we uh, hint at uh, something in the, something happens in the plot that hints or forecasts something that's going to happen a little bit later on in the story. Uh, I think one example of foreshadowing in Cathedral is when Bub, the narrator, and uh, Robert are talking and um, they're watching TV and they're watching the documentary and uh, Robert says something like, you know, well, learning, learning never ends. You know, I'm always, I'm always up to learn something new. And that in the moment, it seems, you know, like a pretty innocent thing to say, but once we finish the story and then reread it, we might notice, oh, that moment really foreshadows the climax. It, it, it foreshadows that moment of uh, learning. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to call this an epiphany that uh, the narrator experiences at the end of the story. We'll talk more about epiphany um, when we get into to paper two. Okay, so we've just sort of covered the basic concept of the story arc. We introduced uh, a, a handful of, of terms that you wanna be familiar with and that you wanna use for uh, paper number one. Let's talk now briefly a little bit about some good strategies, some good sort of best practices for writing plot summaries. So both the slideshow we just walked through and this this document about strategies are, are of course things I will be posting on on Blackboard along with this presentation. So please feel free to, to refer to these uh, as you see fit. Uh, number one, a plot summary of a short story is an objective summation of the story's plot. Okay, a strong plot summary mentions names of characters. It covers all of the major plot points, including the climax and any resolution that is contained in the story. Any any um, uh, post climax. Uh, action, any falling action, in other words, as well as anything that occurs at the end to really resolve and wrap up the story. Um, number two, this is going to involve exercising your paraphrasing and summarizing skills, which you have uh, hopefully been practicing in other classes and certainly in comp one. Focus on the major plot points in a story you could ignore minor details. Now for paper one, I'm giving you basically a page and a half, page and three quarters at most, to write a complete plot summary of either Sonny's Blues or Paul's Case. And again, those stories are like 20 pages long or something. They're long in terms of short stories. Um, there's some of the longer stories you're gonna read, in fact, this summer for me. Uh, it is possible 
it is very possible to summarize those stories in that amount of space. But you have to be very careful. You have to paraphrase and summarize very carefully. And that's really what number three is about. Um, one of the dangers, one of the pitfalls you may experience is something I just call microscoping. Uh, it's very common for uh, beginning writers when they're summarizing, you know, whether it's a story or an essay or whatever, they will just sort of put the microscope down to the opening paragraphs and opening pages, and they'll just summarize and summarize and summarize and summarize all of that stuff. And they're going on and on and on about it, and they're maybe also including some of the more minor details that can actually be left out. Well, if you do that for paper one, you're going to find yourself at the end of, you know, the first page of your, your essay, maybe the top of the second page, and you are going to be, you know, in the uh, cab ride with, with Sonny, if you do Sonny's Blues. Uh, you're going to be at the, you know, the, the um, uh, night where, where Paul is at work. And he's admiring the art. Oh my gosh, there's so much more story we have to summarize. When uh, student writers do this microscoping thing, they realize, oh my goodness, I only have you know half a page left, and then they just breeze through the rest of the story, and they don't summarize it well at all. So you you need to balance out the entire story. You can't you can't give so much weight to the opening pages of the story. You have a lot of pages that you have to summarize. You have a lot of paragraphs to summarize. Um, so try balancing out your summary as best as you can. Don't write a lopsided summary. Plot summary is given in what I call the order of revelation. So an author is uh, writing a story, a narrator is revealing the story to us in a certain order. And like I said earlier, that order tends to be chronological, but sometimes we flash back, sometimes we tell stories out of chronological order, and that's fine. When we summarize a story that does this, we need to honor the original order of the story. We can't uh, artificially go in and move things around and, and force them into a chronological order. That is ruining the intent of the story and, and the author's intent, I think. So we have to honor what I call the order of revelation in a story. Don't bend the story into a false, made-up chronology that you think is better. Um, that's, that's not what you are that you're not you're not allowed to do that in a plot summary. A summary is an objective summary of the story and that includes not only what happens in the story but also the order in which things happen in the story. Number five, I said earlier that you need to be objective. So that means in a summary you do not insert your opinions, you do not try to interpret anything, you don't analyze anything, you don't argue about anything. That'll come later. Now, in, in paper one, you're not doing really any arguing or analysis at all. It's just a plot summary followed by a central idea statement. So in your summary, don't attempt to do any analysis or interpretation. Number six, um, it's sometimes tempting to, in a, in a plot summary, to you know write about character write about the nature of the character, write about the, the personality traits of the character. Um, there will be time for that in paper too. Uh, in a plot summary, it's you know okay to say a few things about character. For instance, in Sonny's Blues, it would be okay to you know say that the narrator is a math teacher. Um, I mean, that's early in the story. He's in front of his students thinking, so that's a plot point I think you would include in the summary. And to do that well, you would probably want to say that he's a math teacher. Um, you, in Paul's case, um, you know, we, we learn early on in the story that uh, uh, people are sort of, um, people sort of wonder about Paul because he dresses kind of flamboyantly. So we could maybe mention that in a plot summary, but we don't want to go on and on and on about that. Uh, in paper two, you'll be able to write about character 
more in depth. So you want to save that kind of stuff for, for a, something like paper two. Focus on the action in a plot summary. That's the most important stuff. Number seven, um, it's very traditional to write plot summary in what we call literary present tense. Okay, so, you know, of course, the stories were written in the past and they're set, I mean, they're works of fiction, but they were set in, you know, previous eras. Uh, Paul's case, I think uh, the setting is the early 1900s, like the 1910s, 19, you know, 11, 1912, somewhere in there. Um, uh, Sonny's Blues occurs in the 50s, basically. Um, so they're set in the past and they were written in the past. But when we give summary, we like to use present tense. So I give an example here of a, a line uh, of summary from uh, Edgar Allan Poe story, The Cask of Amontillado. I say, Montrester leads Fortunato down into the catacombs. Um, uh, uh, Sonny talks with his older brother as they ride in the cab back to the narrator's apartment. Um, uh, Paul sits and listens as his teachers discuss his fate in their, their meeting. So we use present tense verbs, so make sure to do that. Now, um, if you encounter a quick flashback, then it's okay to maybe shift to past tense. If you encounter a story in which you're summarizing and the flashback is extensive and within the flashback we're getting action and dialogue and you know maybe lots of time passes then it's okay to use past tense but it's also okay to use present tense. Um, I guess maybe the rule of thumb is if you want to play it safe just use literary present tense for, for everything. Number eight, uh, don't use quotes very often in plot summary. You know, uh, in the sample essay, I think I give you two very brief quotes. They're certainly not even complete sentences. Um, so it's okay, you know, to sprinkle in a little style in your, in your plot summaries, but don't pack them with quotes. You will be needing quotes in other parts of papers, starting, starting in paper two. You will need to quote what we call textual evidence to illustrate some points that you're making about character and conflict. So don't worry, you'll be quoting a lot from short stories. But in plot summaries, we really want to avoid quotes. And think about it, quotes take up a lot of space. And you don't have a lot of space to write a plot summary of these longer stories. So quoting is only going to work against you. Uh, in the first sentence of a plot summary, and this is certainly true for my paper assignments, it may not always be true for other professors, but we like to have that first sentence be an initial one sentence summary of the entire story. This one sentence summary, of course, will be very general. It's got to take the entire story, start to finish, into account. In that sentence, you also want to give the story title, the full title, and the full name of the author. Please remember, this is very traditional, very common um, thing to do. We, the first time we bring up an author's name, we use the full name, James Baldwin, Willa Cather, in the case of paper one. Uh, but ever after, we only refer to the author's last name. So Baldwin writes, or Cather states, or something like this we would never refer to James or Willa, and we don't need anything like Mr. Baldwin or Ms. Cather. Just the last names are fine. Story titles always go in quotes. Finally, uh, as you give your summary, and I'm reminding you of something I've said earlier, and it's in the directions of paper one, make sure that you use terms in your plot summary that relate to the story arc. Uh, exposition, backstory, plot points, rising action, tension, climax, falling action, resolution, denouement. If you see flashback or flash forward or foreshadowing, go ahead and use those terms as well. Again, we don't need them in every sentence. You don't need to use all of these terms, but definitely put in a, a liberal sprinkling of these terms so that I know that you know what they mean. All right, thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions about plot uh, or plot terms or story arc, or if you need any 
uh, sort of assistance with writing your plot summaries, please let me know. You can always turn to a learning lab tutor. Uh, I think both of these stories are pretty common stories taught at ACC, so I'm sure most writing tutors will be familiar with them. And good luck, and again, just let me know if you have any questions.